Okay, Brett, uh, if you are ready, we can start. Thank you, thank you. Yes, I'm ready. So I should, I should start, right? Okay. Good afternoon. Very nice meeting every one of you online. This is um, uh, it is Hong Kong time, p uh, seven p.m. Hong Kong time. So so uh, good evening to viewers if you're in Hong Kong, and good afternoon if you are from Moscow. Uh, I'm called to give a give a presentation about arbitration agreement because it's um, well, it's uh, the 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 basis on which we at our arbitration institutions can say can take your cases. Before we go to the arbitration agreements, uh, let's talk about where I come from, and uh, that is CTAC. CTAC is the oldest and most profitable arbitration institution uh, in China. It's been 63 years from now uh, since its establishment. Last year, uh, we accepted 3,333 cases and altogether we have accepted more than 40,000 cases of arbitration, making us actually the busiest, one of the busiest institutions in Asia. And uh, to administer, administer those cases, we have more than 200 case managers at CTAC working with a heavy workload to carry out the case administration. So for CTAC, it's more of an international standard uh, in carrying out arbitration procedures with a Chinese flavor. Let me give you an example. Say for, uh, for, for, for China, we have more than 255 arbitral institutions and not all of them uh, carry out arbitrations in a fashion that you are familiar with. Say for example, we have institutions uh, at local cities in China that administer cases with arbitrators only involved in the process of hearings rather than drafting awards. They have institutions, uh, there, there are institutions that have trees to draft in, uh, arbitral awards instead of the arbitrators, which we CTAC find not very comfortable. So we are a Chinese institution. We are a busy institution, but we are quite to up to the international norm of, arbitra uh, of, of international arbitration. Uh, for CTI Hong Kong, where I work at, uh, we, we are the first offshore arbitral institution of CTAC, uh, and we established in Hong Kong, which carries out common law practice rather than civil law, jurist, uh, civil law practice, which is taken by Chinese mainland. So, for CTAC Hong Kong arbitration cases, for cases that we administer here in Hong Kong, it is the Hong Kong procedural law that by default apply, and it is the common law system that we are living and working in. So for students of Professor Alexandra Molot, uh, Molot <laughs> Alexandra, uh, we, we have uh, a global internship program uh, under the current COVID-19, it is not uh, being interrupted in a way that we can offer externship rather than internship. So if you are interested, you can apply online so we can find project oriented uh, uh, work for use. For example, if we have case research and study, we can allocate some of those work to you and it should be counted as a very unique uh, experience of arbitration. Uh, for your for your resume. Now, moving to the topic that I'm going to have uh, today, it is about uh, a perfect uh, 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 topic 
make for arbitration because this is the start. This is the start of arbitration. We need this to jurisdiction. If we can't say uh, see any arbitration agreement in a contract that you want to have it resolved by us, we 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 we, we won't be able to administer that case. So before moving to the problematic arbitration agreement, I want to start start with a perfectly drift, drafted arbitration agreement, uh, not made for everyone, but it's a standard arbitration agreement. And I want to give you 30 seconds to have a look at it. Great. Now, I highlighted some tricky parts. Those are the parts where we usually find parties would like to make amendments. And some of those amendments are really good because they are tailor-made for their special need. But sometimes the amendment and the changes can create problems. And I will spend the next one hour and say 50 minutes to talk about those amendments and why they become a problem and how we are going to address them. And here we go. The first part is what we call any disputes arising from or in connection with contract shall be submitted to the Hong Kong Arbitration Center. This part, this is good because it basically covers every sort of scenario uh, once or if you want to submit your dispute to CTA Hong Kong. Whatever the dispute that arises out of this contract, it can be a contractual one, it can be a tort one, they can all be submitted to CTA Hong Kong. Sometimes, parties want to make this kind of this more specific and they drafted the contract arbitration agreement in the fashions that have been listed here. Say for example, the first one, they change part into this one. They say any dispute with the amount no more than 10 million USD arising out of this contract shall be submitted to CTAC Hong Kong and any dispute with the amount of more than 10 million USD shall be submitted to the local court. Now I'll give you 20 seconds about this. What is the problem that we may have? Well, at CTA Hong Kong, we can have similar issues like this arbitration agreement where say you have a sale and a purchase dispute. Well, the contract actually provided a sale of products worthy of 20 million US dollars and the claimant by submitting dispute to Hong Kong uh, requested the, the respondent to pay say 5 million US dollars worth of uh, payment for the per, for the for the purchasing price. Okay, it's just a, a quarter uh, of the the total amount. But the respondent argued, counter argued that actually the goods are of defective value. Defective value. Therefore, there are seven million dollar worth of goods which are quite defective. So in total, now it's twelve million. So that would surpass the ten million bar. So that arbitration, if we ever started at CTA Hong Kong, 
may have to be uh, suspended and referred to the local court. So that may be a problem. Also, say there also can be a scenario where you have um, 9.5 million US dollar dispute submitting to us under this arbitration agreement, but the respondent simply uh, counter argue that no, what, what you are claiming for is not this amount, it's more than this amount. CTAC has no jurisdiction. So that's the problem we have for the first question. What about the second one? It says, any dispute regarding the quality of the product shall be submitted to CTAC Hong Kong. Any other type of dispute shall be submitted for mediation. Again, I'll give you 20 seconds to think about this. Anyone would like to make a comment? Again, there can be a dispute regarding whether or not the dispute itself is about the quality of the product. Because the respondent, if he or she would like to uh, do the forum shopping of not having CTAC as a, an arbitration venue, he or she may basically argue that, well, there's more dispute to it rather than simply a quality of product, this dispute. Say there can also be delayed uh, delayed uh, delivery. There can be dispute of uh, lack of payment. All those things may be add on to the current dispute, which shall render basically CTAC Hong Kong having no jurisdiction. So the more specific, specific you define the type of dispute that can be submitted to CTAC, the more tricky in real life because the respondent can often find a dispute that is out of the definition. And once they find some disputes that are out of the definition, they can mess up the current arbitration we are having because CTAC Hong Kong may find that such disputes we are of no jurisdiction. What about the third one? It says any contractual disputes shall be submitted to CTAC Hong Kong. Well, actually, that's uh, an example of explaining why the draft of any dispute arising from or in connection with this contract is uh, taking the maximum of scenarios possible for any party to submit this. Say, for example, if I'm a decorator, okay, I want to do the interior design of my friend and we sign up a contract saying, okay, I'm going to design work. I'm actually to carry out decoration and my friend is going to pay me, say, 3,000 Hong Kong dollars, which, which is quite cheap. Okay, but in carry out this contract, I was doing the painting in my friend's house and I actually accidentally I fell off because they have slippery floor in my in my friend's home. So it's a tortious claim. So if we use the standard, the sample arbitration agreement with the draft of any dispute arising from or in connection with this contract say this dispute, this tortious dispute is not, is, is not a contractual dispute. It's not about the quality of my design or the payment of my friend. It's about me accidentally fell off during my carrying out the, the design work. So it's a tortious claim, but with this sample clause, I can still use this sample clause to claim this arbitration, this arbitration, but with the number three, any contractual dispute shall be submitted to CTA Hong Kong. So if our contract 
has this dispute resolution clause, I cannot claim that tortious claim under the arbitration. So that is the first one, the scope of arbitration. So that is the first part, the definition of the dispute that can be submitted to arbitration. Now, moving on to the next one, this is a big one. This is what we call the intention for arbitration. And this is reflected by the sample clause with the phrase of, with the term shall and with the term for arbitration. Why do we need that? Because parties need to have a clear intention to submit their dispute to arbitration in the arbitration agreement. Otherwise, we may find difficulty in accepting those cases. A typical example would be the first problem. It says, any dispute arising from or in connection with this contract may be submitted instead of shall be. It says, may be submitted to China International Economic and Trade Arbitration Mission, Hong Kong Arbitration Center for arbitration. So technically, if a party, by relying on this arbitration agreement, can still submit the dispute to us and we shall accept the case. But this kind of arbitration agreement does not exclude a possibility of having the dispute submitted to the court. So that's the beauty of the wording shall. It's an imperative word rather than may. So it's just a possibility. It's an option. It can also have other options. Now, moving to the second one. It says, any disputes arising from or in connection with this contract shall be submitted to China International Economic and Trade Arbitration Co uh, Commission, Hong Kong Arbitration Center. This is a, one of the typical arbitration uh, clauses that we receive on, on an everyday basis. And it actually lacks something. It lacks the part for arbitration, which I highlighted in the standard clause. And why is that part important? Because for, for example, for, for CTA Hong Kong, we resolve disputes not only by means of arbitration, we can also resolve parties' disputes by mediation, by conciliation, or expert determination. So we provide multiple types of dispute resolution. Arbitration is one of the options. So without that part, without for arbitration, that part, it is code for us to make a determination that parties would choose us for arbitration rather than anything else. So if we see one of these arbitration agreements or, or agreement, dispute resolution agreement submitted to us, we would ask parties to clarify on this point before the tribunal can make a final determination on whether or not they have jurisdiction. Now that's the second part. Third one, it says, any dispute arising from or in connection with this contract shall be submitted to China International Economic and Trade Arbitration, Hong Kong Commission, Hong Kong Arbitration Center with CTAC rules to apply. This one is better because unlike the second some example, it includes arbitration rules. And if you look at CTEC arbitration rules, in the rules it says, if parties did not add the part for arbitration, like I just said in the second example, the rules has a deemed default position. It would deem that parties have actually chosen CTAC, or CTAC Hong Kong Arbitration Center in this case, for arbitration. There is an intention for arbitration if you have decided to apply CTAC rules in your dispute resolution. So that's the difference of the third example against the second one. Now, moving to the fourth example. This is a, again, a very common 
dispute resolution clause, yet it has serious problems that would affect parties' procedure in arbitration. It says, parties shall seek amicable negotiation and mediation first. If no settlement can be reached, the dispute shall be then submitted for arbitration at CTEC Hong Kong Arbitration Center. This is a very serious one. Uh, well, every, every example is serious because they're real and sometimes they encounter difficulties. But the fourth one is so common that I would like everyone to draw special attention to. Now I'll give you 20 seconds to think about it. Okay. Now, firstly, this is what we call a multi-tiered dispute resolution clause. So basically, uh, in this clause, parties are instructed to do A first and then to do B, right? So the A part is here. It says parties shall seek amicable negotiation and mediation first. It sounds about right, right? It's a, it's a good intention. Say, like, for example, if you're a lawyer and if you are drafting a, a dispute resolution clause uh, with an, another party, at that time, everything just started. Uh, the business just started. So you're all talking about beautiful things that you are about to do by carrying out this, uh, this contract. So this part is sort of, um, well, you want to make it sound nice and amicable. It's, it's like uh, if you are dating, Dating, you're dating, and finally you are getting married. You don't want to talk about the divorce, right? Or if there's a divorce, you want to say, okay, let, let's just divorce amicably. Let's just not make everyone look bad. Let's just have a a nice, a nice separation. So that is the the, the good. Well, you want to have your dispute resolution clause sound friendly. Let me just put it this way. And it's fine. Actually, a lot of a, a large portion of dispute resolution clauses are drafted like this, but with more carefully considered wordings. So this one is a, is a not a good one. This one has issues, and I'll talk about how to draft, uh, how to correct those issues at a later stage. But let me get back to this the, the problem that this clause has. It says parties shall seek amicable negotiation and mediation first. That's fine. Difficulty in carrying out this part is immense. You, you don't know how that, you don't, there's no clue. There's no procedure. There's no structure as to how one party shall carry out the negotiation process and mediation process. It's too vague. For example, if Alexander and I carried out a, a, a sales contract and we have this clause and, and there's a dispute and I want to submit to arbitration. And before I submit the dispute to arbitration, I checked this dispute resolution clause and it says, oh, parties should do negotiation and mediation first. Okay. Now do that. So I give Alexander a call and I said, uh, just ask him, okay, we have this dispute and we have to work the problem out. We have to negotiate. 
and mediate. And uh, Alexandra just never replied to me. Then I think, oh, settlement can be reached. Now I'm able to submit my dispute to arbitration at City of Hong Kong. Then Alexandra showed up at the beginning stage of arbitration. He basically tell CTI Hong Kong, no, you don't have jurisdiction because according to the arbitration clause, we have to carry out negotiation and mediation first, but there's no negotiation being done. There's no mediation being done. There's no such procedure being carried out. We cannot, no settlement can be reached. Therefore, CTI Hong Kong don't have jurisdiction for this case. See, that's one of the situation that we can think of in realizing this arbitration agreement. Well, if you look at case law, uh, I think there have been several UK case law on this point. Uh, so this arbitration clause is okay in a sense that according to some judges opinion uh, the first part the parties shall seek amicable negotiation and mediation first this part is too vague to be enforced so this part the first part is too vague to be enforced this part is not valid so parties should go directly to the second part which is arbitration so actually parties can go to arbitration without even the need to consider negotiation and mediation because there is no specific arrangement of how to carry out negotiation and mediation. Another example which is common, common uh, in this type of uh, multi-tier dispute resolution is what we call, uh, let me give you an example, say parties shall first seek amicable negotiation first. And if no settlement can be reached within 30 days after negotiation, the dispute will be then submitted for arbitration at CTA Hong Kong Arbitration Center. With that type of uh, dispute resolution clause, um, it's more specific than the current one, yet it still have problem. It still has problems. And just put it here. If no settlement can be reached with 30 days after negotiation. Now, the issue is, which is commonly occurring, how to calculate the starting date of negotiation. So if Alexandra and I are having a problem, we were not actually having any problem, which is using your professor as an example. Say, I give Alexandra a call. I say, we need to work this issue out. Let's have a talk. Does that sound like the starting point of negotiation? Or should I put that in writing and use that as an evidence? that the negotiation process has started. You see the problem here? Also, with mediation. And let me put mediation here. There can also be issues with this kind of drafting. Say, what if parties cannot reach a process of mediation? Say, what if parties never get to agree on a mediator and they carry out the whole mediation process? Again, this is again quite commonly drafted arbitration clause with mediation as the uh, precondition, with a failed mediation as the precondition. But what if parties never get to start the mediation? 
to start with. That's also a problem. Now, how to cure this issue? How to cure this problem? Well, a lot of institutions and a lot of mediation centers, they actually have mediation rules. So if you want to make your negotiation and mediation process more specific and easier to carry out, they have always been mediation rules for parties to follow or negotiation rules to follow. You just need to check those websites and to check the names of that rules, say, for example, at CTAC, we have CTAC mediation rules. So you can actually incorporate CTAC mediation rules in this dispute resolution clause to give a specific structure for parties as a guidance of how to do the pre arbitration process. So, in that way, the amicable negotiation negotiation and the mediation part can be carried out more smoothly. And if there has been a failed mediation, parties are more smoothly going forward to the arbitration process. Good. Now, Moving on to the name of institution. Our institution has a long name, China International Economic and Arbitration Commission, Hong Kong Arbitration Center. It's quite a mouthful. Therefore, it is quite easy for parties to get our names wrong. And the followings, well, there have been some examples of getting the names wrong, but uh, the name of an institution contained in the arbitration agreement can be very crucial, especially in some jurisdictions like Chinese mainland. And I'll give you some examples to explain to you why we should address them very carefully. Now, the first arbitration agreement, it says dispute resolution arbitration in Beijing. Beijing being the capital city of China adopting Chinese arbitration law. Well, this arbitration agreement is so bad in a way that it is invalid. Parties cannot go to arbitration under this situation. And why is that? Because it did not specify the name of arbitration institution and you can't identify an arbitration institution for parties to submit their disputes to. In China, if, if your case is seated in Chinese mainland, Chinese arbitration law should apply. And once Chinese arbitration law should apply, you should, according to the law, not have your arbitration arranged in an ad hoc manner. That is to say, you have to specify an arbitration institution in your arbitration agreement. Say, if you say arbitration in Beijing, in Beijing, there have been several arbitration institutions, say CTAC, with headquarters in Beijing, Beijing Arbitration Commission, CMAC, China Maritime Arbitration Commission. So there have been more than arbitration institutions in Beijing. And by merely saying arbitration in Beijing without the identification of a specific arbitration institution, such arbitration agreement shall be deemed invalid. That is why, say, if you have an arbitration agreement, simply say arbitration in Beijing, arbitration won't be able to help. You have to go to the court for dispute resolution. Now, Comparing that with the second example that I have here.
it says arbitration in Nanjing. It's a it's a it's a it's a different city in Chinese mainland, which also requires parties to, well, if you want to have arbitration seated there, you need to apply uh, Chinese arbitration law and you need to identify an arbitration institution. Now, with that. Again, you need to consider whether or not you have identified an arbitration institution because you cannot have ad hoc arbitration there. But unlike Beijing, there has only been one arbitration institution in that city. So potentially, this arbitration agreement is still valid because there has only been one arbitration institution, Nanjing Arbitration Commission. So technically, if the courts are at a pro-arbitration stance, they would find that parties have actually specified an arbitration, arbitration institution. And it is an institutional arbitration instead of ad hoc arbitration. So this clause is valid. Parties can go to Nanjing Arbitration Commission for arbitration without too much difficulty. But you need uh, to prove to the court if there has been a dispute regarding the validity of this arbitration agreement, you need to prove to the court that actually parties have actually identified or actually had Nanjing Arbitration Commission in mind when they drafted this arbitration agreement. Now, moving to the third part, the third question. It says, any dispute shall be submitted to CCPIT Hong Kong branch for arbitration. For this, CTAC Hong Kong still administer this type of cases because CCPIT is CTAC, is where CTAC is established. It's short for China Council for the Promotion of International Trade. So CCPIT Hong Kong branch, and with that, we well, on a prima facie level, when we consider whether or not to accept this kind of uh, cases, we would think that well, there has been some indication that parties have actually agreed to have it, have their disputes submitted to CTAC Hong Kong Arbitration Center. So that is fine on a prima facie level. At the later stage, when we accept the case, uh, the tribunal, the arbitral tribunal, who are going to carry out the uh, substantive hearing of the case, including jurisdiction, will take both parties' uh, submissions into account and uh, try to identify, what, identify whether or not they have agreed to submit their dispute for arbitration at CTAC Arbitration Center. The fourth example, a dispute shall be submitted to Hong Kong Economic and Trade Arbitration Commission. We have administering five cases of this kind with such uh, arbitration clause. Well, the problem of this arbitration agreement It's quite obvious because there has been no, there has been no Hong Kong in Economic and Trade Arbitration Commission. Some would argue that people just or parties just draft this name because they take everything for granted because there has been a China uh, International Economic and Trade Arbitration Commission, and what about Hong Kong? Hong Kong must have one here in Hong Kong City. A special administrative region. So how about we just change Hong, uh, China into Hong Kong? And if there's any dispute, let's just submit the dispute there. Well, before the establishment of CTAC Hong Kong, parties used to submit this kind of uh, arbitration agreement uh, to HKIAC, Hong Kong International Arbitration Center. And some parties uh, may, uh, some parties may, 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 may believe that this this is a valid arbitration agreement uh, for parties to submit their dispute 
for arbitration in Hong Kong without any specified institution because there has been well, Hong Kong Economic and Trade Arbitration Commission. It was a non-existent. And has been agreed by at least one tribunal uh, before Hong Kong IEC. Uh, they believe that this is a valid arbitration agreement for an ad hoc arbitration in Hong Kong because it says arbitration shall be submitted to Hong Kong. And there is a word arbitration there as well. So that's an, an uh, that's an indication that parties would like to resolve their disputes by arbitration. So uh, there you go. That's an arbitration ad hoc in Hong Kong. But after the establishment of CTAC Hong Kong Arbitration Center after 2012, uh, we started to see parties submit this, 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 uh, their disputes with this arbitration agreement to us. And uh, several tribunals have uh, uh, made a decision that the, the, uh, by reading this, uh, or some would regard this as a typo, they want parties want to submit the dispute to CT Hong Kong. So this is a typo. Uh, some would say that without a clear uh, clear uh, indication that parties have agreed to submit uh, this kind of dispute to CTA Hong Kong, they read this arbitration agreement uh, from a, an objective view. And uh, with an objective uh, interpretation of this clause, this clause means that parties intended to submit their dis potential dispute to CTA Hong Kong. So most of the, if not all, the, uh, the tribunals formed at CTA Hong Kong believe that this is a valid arbitration agreement, problematic, but valid for CTA Hong Kong to administer. The last one, it says, dispute, if not any, shall be submitted to an arbitration institution in Hong Kong. I'll give you 15 minutes to think about this. Before I get to the, this, this specific arbitration agreement, uh, to give you a, a background of Hong Kong arbitration legal structure. So Hong Kong use model law. Well, not technically use model law. Our arbitration law is mirrored on, on, on the model law and we made our own modifications. So we here in Hong Kong, accept ad hoc arbitration. As a matter of fact, there have been a great amount of ad hoc arbitration going on on a daily basis. So yes, if if you uh, if your arbitration clause is as easy as arbitration in Hong Kong, that's valid. So there has been a fourth position to, uh, under the Hong Kong arbitration ordinance. So you cannot agree on whatever they cannot agree there has been a default uh, position on in the Hong Kong arbitration ordinance, basically tell, to tell parties how to proceed, how to carry out their ad hoc arbitration if they reach a deadlock. So ad hoc arbitration in Hong Kong, okay. So arbitration in Hong Kong, that arbitration clause is valid. It's not like the first one arbitration in Beijing that's invalid. So you need to think about the, the, the context. Uh, regarding which arbitration law to apply to think about the validity of arbitration agreement. So now let's come, come to the, the fifth example. It says, dispute, if any, shall be submitted to an arbitration institution in Hong Kong. There have been many arbitration institutions in Hong Kong, the local one being Hong Kong International Arbitration Center, Hong Kong IEC, and in 2006, I would say 2005, 2006, ICC opened its first Asia branch 
So ICC is in Hong Kong. CTAC, the place that I work at, CTAC Hong Kong Arbitration Center, opened up in 2012. And CMAC, China Maritime Arbitration Commission, opened up in 2014. So, so there are quite a few reputable arbitration institutions uh, here in Hong Kong. So to start with, we read this arbitration agreement. It says arbitration, it says dispute shall be submitted to an arbitral institution in Hong Kong. If it says for arbitration, I put it here. That's a clear valid arbitration clause. And uh, in our institution, HKIEC, CTAC Hong Kong, ICC would have jurisdiction. It took, it's totally dependent on which institution the, the claimant submitted their dispute to. Now, without the full arbitration part, it's getting trickier because there's no indi indication about what method any of our, inst our institutions here in Hong Kong should carry out for the dispute. Because most of our institutions, we can carry out dispute resolutions in multiple ways, Ar arbitration, mediation, expert determination. So it's a, it's a questionable arbitration clause. We have to hear what parties say about it before we move on. It's been 45 minutes. I usually take a break during 50, uh, for 50, 45 minutes, but uh, online, so I won't, let me just finish it. Uh, so so I, I will not use two hours, mo most likely one hour and a half to finish, or if, if not even fewer. So I, I thought we could have a lively discussion, but uh, uh, it's fine, it's fine. I'll, 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 I'll talk about the issues and you can, if you, you can think about those questions and uh, you find not be able to discuss on this stage, at this stage, you can actually send me an email so we can discuss further, okay? So, okay, I'll, I'll carry on. Now, parties need to specify the arbitration rules they want to use in their arbitration because arbitration rules is a detailed structure and a procedural guideline that both parties or all the parties need to follow in their dispute resolution process. It's more detailed than the arbitration law. It provides a lot of default position. So when parties cannot agree on certain things, you can rely on the arbitration rules to find out what should parties do. But you need to think about which route to apply because that's something you can agree on to. And once think carefully by choosing a very appropriate rules for your arbitration process, it can smooth the procedure of arbitration. If not, there can be problems. And I listed several examples here. And they all take some time for us to resolve. And by taking some time, that, that costs parties money, that costs parties time. Now, the first one, and it's a quite simple arbitration agreement. It says arbitration at CCPIT with provisional rules to apply. So that is, it is weird because I still get to see arbitration agreement of this kind submitted to us. It is such a, an old arbitration uh, sample clause. It's, I think it's been there in the 1960s. Yes, somehow parties still found them uh, on Google, I guess, and uh, they copied them. 
uh, or, or copied them from their older contracts and, and uh, use them in their current contracts. So CCPIT, so it's, it's where CTAC is established. So that means uh, arbitration basically can understand it as arbitration and CTAC with provisional rules to apply. So that provisional rules um, is temp was uh, a temporary res uh, resolve resolvement uh, for 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 CTAC uh, during 1960s 1950s. So it's a quite old rule. That's the first edition of CTAC rules, and uh, most arbitrators uh, specified in that provisional rules have actually uh, passed away. So there's no way we can carry out arbitration with the provisional rules. So it's just too dated. So uh, with several cases we uh, we have here at CTA Hong Kong, we regard parties as if they are choosing the current arbitration rules because this part, the provisional rules, is not enforceable, it's not valid. We just deem that parties have agreed uh, to submit that dispute at CTAC, then they use the current rules. We just, as if they didn't specify, so we give them full position, which is the CTAC current rules 2015 for them to arbitrate. Now, the second part is quite juicy because it involves more than one institution. It, it's still quite common. It's, it's a kind of operation that will never go away. Parties will still, even today, will still use this type of arrangement. Um, and I'll explain at a later stage. Let me just read this uh, arbitration agreement out to you and uh, ask you to think about the issues that may have after, after a dispute arises. It says, Arbitration at CTAC Hong Kong Arbitration Center with ICC, which is short for International Chamber of Commerce. So that's uh, an international, uh, internationally reputable uh, institution, one of the most reputable in, uh, arbitration institution in the world, established after World War One. Okay, so arbitration at CTAC Hong Kong Arbitration Center with ICC rules to apply. But the, uh, you should just disregard this part. Never mind. Uh, Now, what's this problem? To appreciate the problem of this, you need to understand, or you need to have a look at each institution's arbitration rules first. If, for example, ICC rules. In the ICC rules, you have ICC's own arrangement on, on how to carry out arbitration process especially some important decisions are going to be made by ICC institution itself. For example, when parties cannot nominate or appoint arbitrators, who are going to take the default role to appoint arbitrators for them? If you look at ICC rules, it is certain organ of ICC. Now, if parties choose seat at Hong Kong, CTAC arbitration rules would be ap applicable at the same time. And if you look at CTAC arbitration rules, and I put it back here, 2.3, it basically says parties are fine to choose CTAC or CTAC Hong Kong Arbitration Center as an institution and choose an institution's rule as, as the applicable rules here. But CTAC shall carry out management rule and that management rule shall include decisions to make such as making appointment of arbitrators so there might be conflicts here and this kind of draft can be seen on all sorts of situations say parties you may say an arbitration agreement that's arbitration at HKIEC with SIAC rules to apply or vice versa. So it's quite difficult 
for us to manage in real life situation. So of course, parties at CTAC, if we have this kind of uh, uh, draft of arbitration agreement, we encourage parties to reach out a solution. For example, do they want to change the rules or do they want to change the institution? And if they agree, there shall be an update of this arbitration agreement. So that's the problem. And another example can be, for example, ICC has its own fee arrangement. It's like uh, it's about uh, what parties need to pay, how much parties need to pay, and to whom pay to whom. And CTAC has its own fee arrangement and the collection method. So those kind of arrangements and regime they conflict with each other. CTAC's fee arrangement is conflicting against ICC fee collecting regime. So it makes management of those procedures tricky. But still parties get, maybe one party insisted on using CTAC and the other party insisted on using ICC. So they sort of, they, they, they hybrid the two elements into one arbitration agreement. And that's why still nowadays we see this type of uh, drafting still quite normally, but that's a problem. That's a problem. Maybe, maybe you can, you can, you can sort of take notice of, and uh, talk about the potential consequences that this type of uh, agreement uh, parties may have, and the parties may think twice about this kind of arrangement. Now, the third part of the problems that I put here is well, arbitrary. Uh, well, I put here and I read it out. It says. Arbitration at CTEC in Beijing with uncentral rules to apply. And that's that's it. Now the problem with this well, well, I'll, I'll, I'll first how about I just give you 20 seconds to think about this first. And uh, you can think about this with the underground uh, knowledge, background knowledge that in Chinese mainland, in Beijing, ad hoc arbitration is not allowed. So it cannot carry out an arbitration in Beijing ad hoc. What's the problem with this arbitration agreement then? Well, to answer that question, you need to understand that uncentral rules, um, uncentral arbitration rules, to be exact, is typically made for ad hoc arbitration. Therefore, by applying uncentral rules, one party might argue that you actually carry out an arbitration at CTEC in an ad hoc fashion, and that is not out according to Chinese arbitration law. But uh, again, this is a real case at CTAC. Uh, I, I modified the arbitration agreement slightly, but uh, cases of this kind actually take place at CTAC. And uh, one of those cases is actually to the court uh, for the court to determine the validity of this arbitration agreement. And uh, the Supreme People's Court uh, actually uh, was involved in identifying whether or not this agreement is valid and they find that this agreement is valid so this actually is fine but they carry out uh, the finding of the court is actually worth noticing in that the supreme people's court regard regard this type of arbitration agreement should be carried out in institutional arbitration rather than ad hoc arbitration Albeit, although uncentral arbitration rules to apply, with CTAC being the administrative body, this, according to the court, is still an institutional arbitration. 
So it is valid. It is not ad hoc. It is valid. CTAC takes the administrative role using a rules of arbitration that is usually made for ad hoc arbitration. So it's fine. And if you are interested in this type of uh, case, take a look at Investor against Yishen Petrochemical. So this is where the case comes from. And you can take a look at the course reasoning on this. Well, I've been talk talking about times uh, that in Chinese mainland, you cannot have ad hoc arbitration. But that doesn't mean if you have an ad hoc arbitration, say in Moscow, the award will not be enforced in Chinese mainland. Chinese courts will enforce an ad hoc arbitration if the seat of arbitration allows for ad hoc arbitration. For example, in Hong Kong, parties do ad hoc arbitration fairly often. And once the award is made, it can be enforced in Chinese mainland because, China, uh, in, because Hong Kong allows ad hoc arbitration. And if the seat of arbitration is in Hong Kong, and if, if it is an uh, ad hoc arbitration, it's fine. Chinese mainland will recognize it. What you cannot do is to carry out the arbitration itself in an ad hoc fashion in Chinese mainland. One of the features of arbitration, moving on to the next slide, is the finality of arbitration. Uh, that means once you have the arbitral award, unless extreme circumstances, you are not allowed to appeal to the local court. It's final. Arguably, that's one of the reasons arbitration can cost less than litigation because at, at litigation, you can have appeals at different instances of courts, or you can have a retrial, which can be more problematic, but that's the story uh, for another day. Let's focus on arbitration. In most jurisdictions, arbitration is final, including Chinese mainland, including Hong Kong. Well, in Hong Kong, the slight difference is that on, uh, well, you can opt in in your arbitration agreement to allow for uh, an appeal uh, for several circumstances. But again, it's very rare, rare and parties seldomly opt in that kind of uh, appeal uh, procedures in their, uh, in their arbitration agreement. So you, it's quite safe to say in most safe in most situations in Hong Kong and in Chinese mainland, arbitration is final. And that is a feature of arbitration in these two jurisdictions. But here we are, we have problematic arbitration agreements sent to us, submitted to us. And uh, the pr problem, uh, the, the example can be fine here. It says arbitration at CTAC in Hong Kong, that's fine. But here is the problem. It says if any party is not satisfied with the decision of arbitration, they shall then refer the dispute of litigation, uh, refer the dispute to litigation at a court in Hong Kong. And I'll give you 20 seconds to think about it. Is there an identification for arbitration? Is party's intention for arbitration clear? I guess so. I think so. I believe so. Because it says arbitration as CTAC in Hong Kong. What about this part then? If any party is not satisfied with the decision of arbitration, they shall then refer the dispute to litigation at the court in Hong Kong. I'm not in a position to to, 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 to comment on what the court may find, but it can be argued that it's highly unlikely that this part is valid because arbitration, according to Hong Kong Arbitration Ordinance, is final. Arbitration award is not subject to appeal under, well, unless extreme circumstances. 
So you may try to set aside the arbitral award. That's a different story. Well, on the well, if you if the arbitration is carried out in, 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 without an arbitration agreement, that's one example. Without valid arbitration agreement, you can always set aside an arbitral award. So you, you, there is some result to the court after the, the award is made, but you can't appeal. You cannot appeal. You can set aside, but uh, there are requirements for a successful setting aside of arbitral awards. So I personally would uh, believe that um, the second part of this arbitration agreement is not valid. Arbitration, once carried out, once the award is made, that's it. That's it. You can't go to the court. You can't have two bites at one cherry. Some parties, though, say, for example, in Chinese mainland, uh, in real life, we see some parties would, uh, take a hit at the first part of this arbitration agreement. And let me put it here. Let's say arbitration at, say, Beijing Arbitration Commission. Then let me put the second part here. If any party is not satisfied with the decision of arbitration, they shall then refer the dispute to litigation at the court in Beijing. Some would argue that this first part is not valid because it is not enforceable. It is not, uh, parties cannot carry out uh, two procedures in this way. The first part is not possible. But, uh, I would, uh, I would just I would say that this kind of argument is highly unlike is highly unlikely to be recognized by the court, because even court uh, uh, let me say courts in Beijing for example, uh, they are at the moment quite pro arbitration, and uh, it is more likely than not that they would regard this arbitration agreement contained in the first part of this dispute resolution clause valid, and once they deem arbitration clause is valid according to the feature of arbitration, it is final. So it is more likely that the second part is not valid after all. Ah, the juicy part, the arbitrators. Well, this is, there's an old saying that arbitration be as good as arbitrators because arbitrators are the decision makers of arbitration and the substantive part, especially substantive rights of parties determined by arbitrators. That's why in real life, when parties adopt sample clause of an arbitration institution, they want to decorate it with some requirements of arbitrators. And that's understandable, although sometimes problems arise. And I show you some problems here on this slide. The first example, it says, uh, uh, the, the presiding trader shall be an experienced expert in IP industry. I'll give you 20 seconds to think about this. It sounds reasonable because most, part, uh, most, uh, most uh, lawyers or students, when they were, uh, they were in, and if, in, if they were in any arbitration courses or, or lectures, talking about the features of arbitration, they would say, oh, one of the features is that actually arbitrators can be more diversified than court judges. Judges are law school students, law school graduates, sorry. Uh, they are masters of law, but arbitrators, they can be jack all trades. They can be from all walks of life. They can be experts. And uh, that's one of the good features of arbitration. So for example, if there has been a licensing agreement and contains IP. So it is reasonable to, to understand that parties have made this agreement on top of their sample arbitration clause. They say the signing arbitrator shall be an experienced expert in IP industry or in fines. That's understandable. But what about the problems? 
I would say that this is too vague and uh, not easy to understand, uh, to enforce. And it is also attracting, attracting counter arguments uh, or, or veto. Let me, let me give you an example. Say, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm from the claimant and I recommend uh, pre, uh, pres, pres, presiding arbitrator A, who I believe is an experienced expert in IP industry. And the respondent, if he's not cooperative, he can always find reasons to attack my recommendation because an experienced expert in IP industry is too sub subjective. It's not objective. It's it, how, how many years of experience make an, a, a, a person in IP industry an experienced expert? Is 10 years sufficient? How about 15 years? How about 20 years? How about years? So there's no objective bar or test to apply. So it, all, it always attracts a counter argument that certain person is not an experienced expert. A solution to update this arbitration agreement. Some people would say, uh, would, well, we, we often see that some arbitration agreements read oh, uh, the presiding arbitrator shall be uh, in a leading financial uh, financial institution uh, and with the work experience of more than certain years. That is quite often, and it's easier to identify candidate arbitrators with that kind of arrangement than the first one. The first one is just too vague. It's just too vague. Contracting that, construct, con constructing that, uh, contrasting that with the fourth one, it says the, the, there should be a sole arbitrator who shall be Mr. Alexander Monot, Monotnikov. What might be the problem in that? Uh, I would say it's fine, right? Uh, Professor Malikov uh, is fine. And then what about, what's the potential problem here? What about the first part? There should be a sole arbitrator. It means that only one arbitrator shall be here in this case. That is fine uh, because one arbitrator theoretically can save cost and time in decision-making. Nowadays in international arbitration, arbitrators uh, often charge on an hourly basis. If not, if it is on an ad valorem system, the more arbitrator you have, more arbitrators you have, the more cost on arbitrators remuneration you can expect. So so arbitrator, fine on cost, and it's more efficient because as a case manager in my earlier years at CTEC Hong Kong, it takes time for three arbitrators to make a decision, to make a decision on anything, to be honest, if it takes three arbitrators. So the first part is fine. The second part technically is fine. There is no significant problem there. But one would avoid specifying names of arbitrators in their arbitration agreement for several reasons. One is that if the dispute arises, say three years after the contract is entered into, and arbitration starts, because the, the, the wording of this agreement is so strict in only Professor Alexander can be the arbitrator. What if he's busy at that time? Or what if he doesn't want to be an arbitrator at that time? He's so good at teaching. Prof being a professor is what he wants to do. And he doesn't want to be that arbitrator at that time. What would happen? Say, or see, for example, that, that can be a reason or more common reason would be time conflict. If, if he's named, in an arbitration agreement, he is usually very famous in that arbitration industry, in the arbitration. 
so he or she can be quite quite busy so that's one of the problems that we may have the second problem we have when we identify specific name of arbitrators in the arbitration agreement is that there can be bias it's not for sure but one may argue that there can be bias for example if what would you think if you have specified names in that in your contract would that attract your your more frequent communication with that arbitrator know with um, knowing that that he or she might be deciding your rights and duties several years later so one would argue that it's not a default position i'm not saying that if you have certain person there as an arbitrator that arbitrator will be deemed biased when he or she actually takes the role of arbitrator for your dispute and as a matter of fact in uk cases or, or in a recent uk case actually uh, it has been that no apparent bias can be found if parties have identifying and the defined names in the arbitration agreement. But there can be problems. One is bias. It might still attract argument in this regard. And second is that it's too rigid arrangement because he or she might not be available at time dispute arises. So that's the fourth example. Now, going back to the second example, it says all three arbitrators shall be non Chinese. It's actually one of the cases at CTAC in Beijing where we have one Chinese party against a German party. And in that arbitration agreement, it says all the arbitrators shall be non Chinese and non CTAC panel arbitrators. So they have had three, I believe, three German arbitrators, or at least two of them uh, were German arbitrators, uh, to hear the case. Expense uh, one uh, in terms of uh, arbitrators' bill, but uh, at the end of the day, everything went smoothly. It's fine, it's fine. Parties can have uh, their, their restriction on the nationality of arbitrators, but non-Chinese is not specific. For example, uh, as a matter of fact, most uh, Hong Kong local, Hong Kong arbitrators, if they are the holders of Hong Kong passport, the nationality also says Chinese because we have one country, two system applies for Hong Kong. Hong Kong people are, are Chinese nationals. Uh, if they hold uh, Hong Kong passport. And uh, that situation, you cannot have Hong Kong arbitrators joined, uh, uh, joining your, your arbitration if your arbitration agreement says arbitrators should be non-Chinese. Also, Chinese, uh, there have been uh, Chinese immigrants everywhere in or everywhere in the world, but uh, uh, in, especially in Asia. For example, uh, a lot of Singaporean have Chinese background, a lot of Malaysian have Chinese uh, heritage. So what about them? Uh, that can be a problem. So you need kind of need to be more specific. Instead of saying non-Chinese, and say non-Chinese passport holders, uh, that in that way, you can you can you can you can make sure that you are identifying the or excluding or including the right uh the, the people that you think are, are right not uh, suitable for your case The third example, it says the presiding arbitrator shall be a non-Chinese, non-French, who is also a current solicitor registered in Hong Kong, who have the linguistic capacity of listening, writing, and reading of Chinese and French. It just doesn't happen 
there there are no people that we are aware of that is a non-Chinese, non-French, is a current solicitor registered in Hong Kong who have the linguistic capacity of listening, writing, and reading of Chinese and French. No person is that capable, I guess. Uh, I think a couple of years ago, we have a similar arbitration agreement that says non-Chinese, but who is a current uh, solicitor in Hong Kong who can write, read, and understand uh, and listen to Chinese Mandarin. And uh, for that, we do have uh, one or two candidates at that time uh, as, were suitable, but none of them had time to hear the case. So neither, well, none of them accepted our nomination. So that case uh, dragged for a long time for the formation of the arbitral tribunal. So you can think about the requirements of the presiding arbitrator. You can design, you can picture the picture for your presiding arbitrator, but the you, you, you should also think about reality. Do those people exist in the world? And uh, are there a sufficient number of arbitrators who would uh, be suitable to hear your case, be available at the time dispute arises? Those are the concerns you may have. For, uh, for for drafting your arbitration agreement. The fifth question though, uh, it, it's a, it is a quite sim simple but problematic one. It goes as simple as arbitration at CTAC and all three parties, or it's a three party contract. It says all three parties get to appoint one arbitrator. So it's fine. Each party gets to appoint one, it sounds fair it's okay and according to CTAC arbitration rules you can arrange you can modify CTAC arbitration uh, rules where necessary uh, so far as it does not uh, contradict the mandatory laws and rules of arbitration here in, in CTAC under Chinese law or whatever law applicable but the problem is parties sort of in this arbitration agreement got one thing missing which is how to make a determination of who shall be the presiding arbitrator under this situation because a presiding arbitrator the role of which is slightly different than the two co-arbitrators because he or she gets to make a procedural decision and might have a casting vote depending on their own arrangement and uh, the role of presiding arbitrator differ from co-arbitrator uh, to a certain extent. So with this arrangement, arbitration at CTAC, all three, all three parties get to appoint one arbitrator. It doesn't specify how the presiding arbitrator shall be arranged, who shall be that presiding arbitrator. So th that part is missing and can be problematic. Last but not least, I want to spend quite some time in this slide. This is the last slide, by the way. Uh, hoping you, I hope you have a great Friday. I don't want to upset you with too many slides and cases. By the way, all the cases that I, all the problematic arbitration agreement I had, they actually, they have real cases uh, to support. You can actually, if you are doing an essay, if you're writing about an essay about the arbitration, there have been a lot of cases uh, in real life that 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 mirror that mirror the cases that I had uh, this afternoon for you. So you can you can dig up and uh, and uh, and uh, find the reasonings of the court judges, and they are very interesting. At least I find them interesting because uh, this is what I do. But okay, let's let's move on to the language of arbitration. Uh, it, this is important because it is. It is heavily negotiated in, in, in the arbitration agreement because when the dispute arises, you are using that language to sort of uh, explain your case. And that's not only about you uh, as the lawyer, it, it also has something to do with your witnesses uh, who might not be that linguistically capable like you lawyers. Uh, graduating or to be graduated from such a good university that you are. So 
it's important. It's important. That's why, say, uh, if you look at this slide, sometimes parties specify the language of arbitration, and that's not that easy for them to do so either. Because one, for one reason, it's a decision. Uh, it's a decision after negotiation. It's not like a, a one side gets to make a determination on the language of arbitration. It's a, it's a negotiated decision. That means you need to negotiate your way to get the language that you prefer. Uh, and also the language of arbitration is not that, it's not that uh, clear cut. There have been multiple situations you need to be aware of, you need to address when talking about the language of arbitration. That's why I say, for example, if you use the, the default sample arbitration clause and you add here, one sentence, it says, the arbitration shall be conducted in Chinese and Russian. It sounds fair because what if one party is from China and the other party is from Russia? It's fine, it sounds fine. And uh, it is fine for us to carry out an arbitration in two languages, technically, yes. But you need to think about the consequence once parties reach this kind of determination. And the consequences start with, what do you mean by having two languages in an arbitration? And I have put it here, several scenarios for you to think about. You need to think about the working language of an institution. Say so for CTAC, everyone is capable of speaking Chinese and English. Some are, are able to speak European languages, but not all of them are, 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 are linguistically capable for European language, continental European uh, languages. That make working language of CTAC Chinese and English. So even with a party's agreement uh, saying that Chinese and Russian shall be the language of arbitration. That can be interpreted as mere the language to be used between parties and among parties and the tribunal. You might still need to submit your case to CTAC with Chinese and, uh, sorry, with Chinese and the Russian is fine, but when you say, ask a question regarding procedural matters at CTAC with a CTAC case manager, you might still use either Chinese and English because those are the working language. So that's why when considering choosing an arbitration institution and, uh, and uh, when the language issue is important for you, you might consider which institution works best. So if you would, link, would, would more be willing to use Russian, as the language for you to communicate between you and uh, the institution, maybe IAC, Russian Arbitration Center, is your choice rather than CTAC. Or if you can talk the Chinese party into having an RAC as the institution, language-wise, it works for you better. Similar for Chinese people, Chinese party, say if they choose Chinese and only Chinese as the language, uh, and get Chinese language agreed by the other party as the language for arbitration, and they submit the dispute to ICC. Maybe ICC secretariat won't be able to answer queries in Chinese for the Chinese party. And Chinese will only be used between communication between parties and among parties and arbitrators. So that's the problem here. Uh, the working language capacity of the institutions is something you need to take into consideration. And submission. If arbitration shall be conducted in Chinese and Russian, you need to submit your submission, whether it's a factual submission or uh, a legal submission, it shall be in both languages. Say, for example, if it's the statement of claim, you sh it should be in two languages. That should be fine because you can get it translated and uh, the translation costs 
may not be that much because well, if, if you have a very long translation, if you have a very long uh, submission, it could be say 100 pages, but still it's fine. What's heavy on cost of translation is the evidence because, because sometimes we, we, we can easily have 20 box of evidence for one case. And if you translate them, it could be both time and cost consuming. And uh, what do you mean by arbitration shall be conducted in Chinese and Russian? Does that include the evidence or the evidence part shall be excluded and they should only be pre presented in its original language? By simply saying arbitration shall be conducted in Chinese and Russian, you can't tell, you can't tell, and we can't tell what do you mean by that. So if you want, if you expect that you will have heavy load of ex, uh, evidence to be submitted, if you want, don't want to waste too many, uh, too many time or cost on translation, uh, evidence part shall be excluded in that language part. You, you can simply say in Chinese and Russian without uh, excluding evidence, which shall be submitted in its original form of language. That should be fine. Hearing. The, the, the hearing part, technically, you can't have, you cannot have, or it's, I, I have never seen a hearing carry out in two languages. That doesn't mean there's no translation. It's always, there has always been translation in, in, in hearing where parties are from different countries speaking different languages. But you never say, you, you have never heard an arbitrator uh, speak in one language, then translate himself into another language. And everyone, not only the arbitrators, the lawyer, they say one language that they speak and they translate it into another. No, it's usually when and where uh, the witness, when, when testify, he or she testify in a language that they feel comfortable with, then they get uh, consecutively translated to the language that the arbitration hearing is using. And that's it, that's it. They use one language to conduct the hearing. And when the witness, witnesses are not comfortable with the language they use in the hearing, they get it translated. And that's fine, and that's fine. And sometimes we see after the hearing, the whole script of the hearing will get translated into another language. So that makes, for example, Chinese, if they use the Chinese as the hearing language, you have a Russian witness, that Russian witness gets to answer questions in Russian and uh, get it translated by a translator. But the whole hearing shall be in Chinese, or better, shall be English with a uh, service shall be, shall be Russian, the Chinese witness, that's fine. But at a later stage, when the hearing uh, ends, the whole script gets to translate it into another language. That saves cost. That saves cost. Because it doesn't make sense for each one to speak the same content in two languages in the hearing. In the hearing. Last but not least is the award. The award. Um, it's quite often that we have arbitral award drafted in two languages or more than two languages. A CTAP gets to certify uh, each copy uh, with the translation copy. Uh, it's fine, it's common. Uh, for us in practice, we, what we usually do is that uh, with the scrutiny process, we want to solidify, we want to confirm one language, one version, of the award first, then translate. And we, we encourage arbitrators to do so as well, because otherwise it would uh, create a lot of discrepancies among different languages of awards. But again, it's, it's, it's practical, it's doable by parties. If say, if you have arbitration conducted in Chinese and Russian, it's fine, but you need to think things through and you need to work out different parts of submissions, different types of submissions you have for the arbitration. 
regarding what languages you are going to use. Shall it be only one language for certain parts and the other language for other parts? What about the hearing? What about the award? Or what if parties are just fine with one language at certain stage, for example, at hearing? It, could on, it will be only in one language, it's fine, as long as parties made their opening submission and closing submission with the language that they agree on. Since maybe in that situation, both party gets to understand, they actually understand two languages pretty well. So it's fine for them. Maybe that's fine, maybe that's workable, but uh, you need to think about those uh, real, real life issues. Uh, because once we agree on the language of arbitration, well, after negotiation, the language of uh, a language clause in the arbitration uh, agreement can be very simple and meet conducted in Chinese and Russian. It's fine. It's easy to, to, to be drafted. But in carry out this kind of arrangement, it, it, takes, it takes brain. And they, um, this, 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 this to say it takes time and money to do so. Or if the language clause goes as simple as the arbitration shall be English. What if um, the Chinese party and the Russian party decided to have their arbitration in English as like a, a third a sub language where everyone gets a compromise. Everyone step back and let's say, let's just use English. What about that? Well, those kind of issues arise. Working language of institution, that's fine. CTAC uh, can carry out arbitration in English perfectly, it's fine. Uh, I have younger colleagues at CTA Hong Kong who can speak English way much better than I do. So I get to, uh, I, so, so, so um, I, after maybe two hours of speaking English, I, I get very tired, but my colleagues, yeah, they're fine. Uh, regarding the evidence, what if all the contracts are, car are carried out in Chinese and Russian? Do they need to be translated into English? What if the arbitrator understand Chinese and English and Russian? So would that still be a need for parties to translate those copies into English? Maybe not. If maybe not, then you should probably think of that when draft the arbitration agreement, exclude the evidence part. Or if, if your language clause is that simple at the later stage in arbitration, you can always try to, to, to make a submission regarding language to the tribunal and ask the tribunal to make a decision on do those documents need to be uh, submitted in, in what kind of language? We can make a submission on that. So that's that's fine. I want to finish today's uh, a talk on arbitration agreement with uh, a final problem. It's called asymmetrical arbitration agreement. Uh, the, well, basically, it's Okay, buyer, if any dispute shall submit uh, the, the, the dispute to Moscow court or CTI Hong Kong for arbitration. A seller, if any dispute shall submit the same to Beijing Intermediate People's Court. So one party gets to have two options, one arbitration, one litigation, and the other party only gets to do one, which is litigation. So that is similar to last year's Vismo problem. So well, the the logic behind or, or the problem behind this arbitration agreement is, is, is that it's not fair one part because um, the way you submit your dispute uh, uh, to a venue is something is some some is, is, is a type of right so substantial for you. So so parties or people, lawyers may argue that you should get equal treatment at least um, you, one for one or two for two. If you get to do litigation and uh, arbitration, I should get to do litigation and arbitration at the same time. So that's what they call, that's why they call it asymmetrical. It's not equally, uh, it's not an equal right for, for both parties when they submit their dispute for resolution. So it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a Vismo problem. So I, my point here is that you can actually, if you're interested in this type of question, because this is a huge chunk of arbitration work you are going to do if you uh, are actually in the field of arbitration, if you're a lawyer in arbitration to, to talk, uh, to, 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 to sort of uh, study the arbitration agreement is a huge chunk of work that you need to do uh, in, the st in the study stage and in the practice stage. So, so one of the major sources you have is real cases and the other major source is some um, Vismut actually 
this mood actually every year they have a problem. The first one is about jurisdiction. The second part of the issue is the substantive issue, uh, primarily about the application of CISG. But the, the, regarding the jurisdictional issue, it's usually about the, the interpretation of arbitration agreements. And most of those arbitration agreements may have problems. It's what we call problematic arbitration agreement. And uh, there have been a lot of submissions by a lot of universities, uh, good as yours, uh, to, 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 uh, which are available online. And you can, talk, you, can, you can take a look at that because there have been so many, so many there. It's a, it's a minefield of uh, uh, gold field, sorry, of, uh, of, 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 um, of uh, useful information regarding this chunk of work. Uh, I'm going to stop here. And uh, if you have any questions, uh, I'm almost using up all my time here. I, um, professor asked me to spend less than two hours and uh, here we go, a oh, hundred minutes. And uh, so if you have any questions, let me know. Uh, here is my email, send me an email and uh, I shall reply. If you're interested in having an internship here at CTI Hong Kong, uh, at the moment, it's impossible because uh, I think you will not be able to come to Hong Kong without a certain period of uh, restraint, uh, restraining at home. Yeah, that would make the internship more difficult than ever. So I will, I will not recommend the internship at the moment at CTI Hong Kong. But if you're interested in externship, meaning that if you want like uh, to have a distant experience of uh, being an, <laughs> an extern at CTI Hong Kong, let us know. I, I believe two years ago, we have two students from uh, your distinguished university to be interns here at CTEC. And one of, uh, one of the interns uh, actually, uh, two, two of them both are very good. One of them uh, I, I was especially uh, impressed of uh, 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 them uh, in that they they found some cases very interesting regarding sea tax enforcement in Russia. So it's very practical. It's about the, uh, I believe, the, the, the address and the service of documents issue. And uh, that enforcement of award, of sea tax award case went to the Supreme Court of, 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 of Russian Federation. Uh, so, so very practical experience they would have. So, so I encourage you to join us. Uh, the working language at CTI Hong Kong is English. So language-wise, you don't need to speak, you don't have to speak Chinese uh, when work here at CTI Hong Kong, but and if you're interested, uh, letting us know. And uh, thank you again for your time this afternoon. I wish you uh, safe, healthy, and, uh, and, uh, and, uh, and, uh, and uh, be happy actually. And nowadays, just uh, with, with, with the world going as it is, uh, have a positive mind, uh, study hard, and uh, find something that would uh, make you happy, that would amuse you. Thank you. Have a uh, good day. Thank you very much uh, for this useful and interesting information. Uh, and uh, I hope uh, we will see you again. Uh, and if it is possible, uh, we would like to ask you to send uh, to us this presentation. Uh, we'll do. I, I think, I believe I've already to Elena. Uh, yeah, yeah, uh, that oh. that's, uh, will be perfect. Yeah. Yes. Okay. Uh, well, yeah. well, if she didn't get it, I'll send it to her again. No problem at all. Ah, uh, uh, did did you send it uh, to her? Yes. Yes. This afternoon. Uh, so this morning. Uh, ah, uh, uh, yes. then uh, there is no need. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much. You're and uh, uh, see you again. I I hope. <laughs> See you soon, and I hope to see you all in Hong Kong when you have time. I believe uh, a group of you uh, visited a couple of years ago, and I hope to see a group of you more <laughs> in Hong Kong in the years to come. It would be really nice. <laughs> I hope so. Um, well, um, thank you again, and goodbye. Have a good day. Bye-bye.